Welcome to the Prison Professors Podcast. We serve people who face challenges with prosecution, sentencing, and prison. My co-founders are Sean Hopwood and Justin Paperni. My name is Michael Santos. We create digital content and our team offers individual consulting services. We also assist agencies that want to improve outcomes. To learn how we can help you, text the word Prison Pro to 44222. Again, text Prison Pro to 44222 and get our free brochure. You can also visit us at prisonprofessors.com or contact Justin at 818 424 2220. Please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Send confirmation that you reviewed our podcast and we'll send you a free digital book. Stay tuned for a 20 to 30 minute episode of Prison Professors. Welcome to Prison Professors. My name is Michael Santos. You're not going to believe who I have with you today. His name is Randy Kearse. Randy Kearse is an awesome dude. I met him when I was in about, I don't know, my 15th or 16th year of imprisonment. I was writing. He was an author. In fact, he was writing his first book, which he's going to talk to us about while he was in prison. He came out of prison more than 10 years ago and has just gone on to make an amazing impact on society writing books, creating programs, going into prisons, going into schools, cutting deals with billion dollar corporations. He is the real deal. I want to introduce you to my friend, Randy Kearse. Randy, thank you so much for taking time to talk with our brothers who are in prison or going into the prison system. Tell us a little bit about your background, if you could do that for us. Michael, I'd like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to be on the show, Prison Professors. Um, Hopefully, um, something I can say today will help the people that's incarcerated right now. Um, I mean, man, it's, it's awesome to be able to talk to you. I forgot the question. <laughs> we, you know, I, we started talking more than, I don't even know how many years ago. I think I was in Fort yeah. Dix Federal Prison yeah. around yeah. 2002 or 2003 when I left there. And I, I enjoyed working side by side with you. What it, my first question for you is to tell our audience a little bit about where you're from and your experience of coming into the criminal justice system. Got you. Well, I'm, I'm 53 years old right now. Um, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Unfortunately, I spent probably about 33 years of my life caught up in the revolving door of the criminal justice system. From the time I was 16 years old, uh, to the time I turned 50, I was involved in the criminal justice system in one shape, form, or another. Uh, either it was jail, prison, probation, parole, uh, in court fighting a case, uh, on the run from the police. I mean, it's been uh, uh, pretty much a third of, over, uh, over half of my life caught up in the criminal justice system. The first time I was uh, arrested, uh, I was involved in a attempted murder where a fight broke out of a skating ring. Unfortunately, I stabbed, I stabbed a guy. Uh, I was 16 years old. I was adjudicated a youthful offender. Uh, you would have thought that experience would have been enough to slow me down and stop me in my tracks, but unfortunately, it just snowballed. And it wasn't until I was 51 years old that I actually was able to free myself from being involved in the criminal justice system. My last uh, sentence was for 15 years in federal prison. I did almost 14 years. Uh, when I came out, I had over 10 years of supervised release, which I did day for day for the 10 years. And in 19, no, 2015, or well, 16, I was finally uh, free of any correctional obligation. Uh, my journey from where I was then to where I am today has been a phenomenal uh, journey. It's been one sometimes filled with a lot of um, challenges. It's been filled with, you know, some setbacks. It's been filled with some accomplishments and some, you know, basically things that I need to redo. But since getting out of prison on this time, I made a vow that I would never go back. And not only that, that I would provide uh, other people with some type of uh, resource or tools or something that would help them better prepare themselves for getting out. So let's, let's take it back. We know that you're, like I told the audience already, you've become very successful since you've come home this time. But help us understand, just in short snippets, about your journey. When you went in, you said you started when you were 16, you went in for attempted murder. Walk us through the different institutions and the time that you served in each one. Do very quickly. Um, when I was 16, I did like six months, five years probation. Um, got No, I, I, I was arrested at 16, got out. Um, after adjudication, this six months, five years probation, uh, didn't complete the probation, uh, wound up going back for, I think, eight months, 
during that particular time. After that, I was arrested for a drug uh, possession, probably like when I was 21, maybe did about a year after that. Uh, then I was involved in a uh, some gun running or something like that. I think I did like two years for that. And then finally I was, um, in 1992, I got the uh, 15 years in federal prison. Um, I mean, there's a difference in being in prison and being in jail, you know. And Where were you in jail? I was in jail in Rikers Island and a couple of other kind of uh, city-run uh, facilities in New York State. Slow it down there. In between those, when you went into those different institutions and that different, uh, that early part of your journey, what kind of mindset did you have? What were you thinking about when you went into the prison system or the jail system at that young age? Um, well, one thing wasn't about change. You know, that wasn't something that was, was in the back of my mind or even in front of my mind of, of actually changing. I was so caught up in the mindset that, you know, going to jail uh, or going to prison was part of the lifestyle that I chose to, to live. That was, that was something that I, I, didn't, I really didn't understand was um, really not a good way to think at that, you know, when you look back. But part of, part of that was just basically, you know, enhancing my reputation, um, learning different other criminal skills, making connections with other people, doing other things. And basically it was just, you know, it was part of my, added to my resume. You know, so that, being that. in jail at that time, you were just jailing. You were part of the crowd doing whatever the people suggested you do to live in prison or live in jail. And the outcome from that, walk us through what you experienced every time you got out of jail. Man, when I, when I got out of jail, basically it was just, I went right back into the same lifestyle that, I, that put me in jail. You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't like, I wasn't ever one of them type of guys who was like a petty thief or, or somebody who didn't think on a grand scale. My um, criminal activity always involved wanting to do something on a, on a big scale. And, and basically during my prison, exp my, my jail experiences and going back and forth in the system at that particular time, it was about how could I do it better? How could I do something that's going to allow me to live a better life inside that criminal lifestyle. So basically, I mean, it was, it was just going right back into the, the part of going to jail was part of doing business. I mean, well, it's all part, part of the game back then. Yeah, part of the game, so-called game, so-called game. So, so that, that changed for you when you went into the federal prison system with a 15 year sentence, yeah. walk yeah. our yeah. audience yeah. through about what inspired you to want to change. Where did you go? First of all, well, my first um, institution that I hit was Lewisburg Penitentiary. Um, I, I was sentenced in 1992. When I got to Lewisburg in 93, I think, like, yeah, end of 93. Um, I mean, it was, it was I, I started off basically not even thinking about what the future is going to hold. What, tell our audience who don't know what Lewisburg is like. I mean, it's a beautiful architecture, but inside it's not so beautiful. Walk our audience through going into a high security United States penitentiary at Lewisburg. You know what's funny? Um, I want to take, I got to take you back to this, this, tell you a little bit about, you know, when I got to Lewisburg. Yeah. I was in a hotel prior to being incarcerated. I was in a hotel in North Carolina. That's where I caught my federal sentence and I was, you know, selling drugs in North Carolina and I was in a hotel room and they had this documentary on about Lewisburg Penitentiary. And it was, you know, showing you all these different guys that were, you know, talking about the experience of being in Lewisburg and show you some of these uh, infamous criminals that were in Lewisburg. And I can remember vividly sitting on the bed and the, and the, the the documentary was playing in the background and I was on the bed counting money and I'm not even paying attention too much to the video and I'm thinking to myself, really, that'll never be me. Now you fast forward two or three years later and I'm pulling up in the bus to go to Lewisburg Penitentiary and it was just ironic that I, was, that I would wind up there after almost being warned of what was to come from that video. When you pull up in the bus, it's just like, it was a gray day, and it was almost like Castle Grayskull. And it seemed like this, the penitentiary had like this cloud around it, and it just seemed so daunting and overwhelming. It just, it was scary, you know, and just- You got on, you got, you went through uh, general population. Tell us yeah. about your welcome into the penitentiary when you first got there. Do you know a lot well, of people from New York? 
there was a lot of people from New York, a lot of people knew me from the street, so pretty much my reputation that I had built preceded me, so I, didn't, I fit right in instantaneously, I didn't have any problems, but my, I would say, um, my reception to the penitentiary itself was after being there for about a week in population, because you know they put you through the reception, and then you go to general population, after being in general population for maybe a week, there was a killing uh, in front of the chow hall. And that was, I guess, the wake up call to say, this is serious. This is not a game. Uh, people die in here, you know, and you have to be careful about how you carry yourself. And, you know, if you're trying to make it home, that there's certain things that you got to be aware of that you have to be um, conscious of at all times. But what's also was striking to me that the killing was amazing to me, but to a lot of people that were there, it was almost like, why are we late for chow? I mean, come on, can you get this guy mopped up so we can go eat? So that was kind of like, you know, that was uh, eye-opening for me. So when you're in that environment, there came a time, and I don't know whether it was at Lewisburg or when you transferred from a U.S. United States Penitentiary High Security Facility to a medium or to a low, there came a time in your journey when you had a shift in mindset. I'd love you to tell our audience a little bit about what inspired you to have that shift in mindset. Well, what clicked for me um, after leaving Lewisburg, I actually wound up going to um, Terry Hutt Penitentiary. And then from Terry Hutt- Can you tell us why? What happened at Lewisburg that they made you transfer to another United States? Well, there was a, a, um, the reason why I left from Lewisburg to um, Terry Hutt, there was a confrontation between some guys from New York and some guys from DC. And unfortunately, the fight and, you know, they spread everybody out. Once this, they feel did that. You get, did you get transferred for a disciplinary reason or yeah, just because yeah, of the friends yeah. you chose? Well, it was disciplinary, but it was because of the guys that I was rolling with. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't directly involved, but I was known to associate with the guys that were involved. Right. So in order to um, basically keep the whole uh, incident from snowballing, you know how it is. They start just shipping everybody out to avoid anything that possibly might happen. So sure, I, I know how it is, but I know a lot of our listeners don't. And that's why I yeah, want them to hear from yeah. you. You are the real authentic man who did time, who got transferred. And I want you to be spreading this message yeah. of how important it is because I'm getting a takeaway from this. Number one, I'm hearing from Randy. Wow, it's really important to get this lesson as soon as I possibly can when I'm in the journey so I don't have to go in and keep coming out and going back yeah. in. Number two, what I'm hearing from Randy is there the friends that I choose in the prison yeah. can have a direct relationship yeah. on whether I have a successful yeah. journey or I start getting shipped around on disciplinary yeah. problems, even yeah. though I didn't do anything. Yeah. So, and, and that was pretty much the case. So that was a learning experience, a learning experience within itself. <clears throat> so when I got to um, Terry Hutt Penitentiary, I moved a little more swiftly. You know what I mean? I, I, I chose a little more um, low-key type people that I hung around. You know, I didn't I didn't want to be in the mix. So I try to kind of like what they call stay out the way. You know, I played a low profile so I could work my way back to the East Coast. So I stayed in um, Terry Hutt Penitentiary. I kept my nose clean. Uh, again, the people, the crowd that I rolled with, you know, was very limited. And I was able to transfer back to uh, Allenwood Penitentiary. Um, and I stayed another there. high security penitentiary. Yeah, yeah. Based that, on, that's, and that's another thing that people don't understand. Your prior criminal history a lot of time plays a part in the type of facility that you will uh, find yourself in because they 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 put you in places based on your prior criminal history. So if you have a bad criminal history, there's more likely that you'll find yourself in a maximum security uh, facility because they think that you're a threat or you're dangerous or things of that nature. And you have to prove yourself as um, time goes on so you can lower your level and you can move to a less secure facility, a less, you know, dangerous facility. And basically, that's how it goes. Let me just ask you a question. So in Terre Haute, fundamentally different adjustment strategy, it sounds like. Instead of running with guys that were getting into trouble, you said that you stayed in the cut, stayed out of trouble. And mm -hmm. by doing that, you were able to avoid disciplinary problems at Terre Haute. Is that right? Yes, sir. And then you moved to Allenwood, which brought you closer to New York City, where you're from, but it was still high security prison. At what stage in your journey did you get to the USP and Allenwood? Um, I, probably was, I probably was like uh, six years into my prison sentence. 
So you were six years uh, into the term, probably had yeah. about another seven or eight to go. Yeah. yeah. And what was your adjustment like at USP Allenwood? Well, once I got to Allenwood Penitentiary, it was a real low kind of profile penitentiary. Everybody was like pretty much, you know, not too much into having like violence. So it wasn't a lot of violence going on. People pretty much stayed to themselves. New Yorkers stayed to themselves because you were so close to home. And I mean, it was only like a three hour ride from New York City to uh, Allenwood that nobody wanted to get in trouble to be shipped out. So you would be able to get more visits and, you know, it was a better situation for you uh, while you were incarcerated to be so close to home. So nobody really was um, trying to mess that up. But don't get me wrong, there was violence that um, happened in Allenwood. I think when I was there for the three years that I was there, I think like four people got killed while yeah, I was there. It, it, any high security penitentiary is always going serious. to be volatile. Yeah, it was and serious. It's always nice. I remember when I went from a USP high security penitentiary to a medium, it felt like the weight of the world came off of me. Tell me when you went to, when you got your security reduction. Okay, when I, when I left, um, as uh, my security level went down, and I know I still got about seven or eight years left, uh, I decided to head down south because I had uh, some family down south. So they um, wanted to transfer me, like, basically from a penitentiary to a medium. So I heard about this place in South Carolina. I had a son uh, and a daughter in North Carolina. So I, you know, I wanted to break up the bid. That's one thing good about the federal system, that you have an opportunity you know, I guess you want to say to travel, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, it gave me an opportunity just to get away um, somewhere, different environment, you know, going from penitentiary to medium. So I put in a transfer for um, Estelle, South Carolina. I got that transfer, and I was like, man, it was almost like, like you said, the weight of the world was off your shoulders, but it was just a whole different experience because, I mean, it, the, it was, the weather was beautiful all year round, pretty much. Um, I mean, it, it was more freedom, you know, after being in the penitentiaries for five, six, seven years. I mean, just the freedom to be able to walk around, you know, and, and, and it was just a better, better, better feeling to be It's a in. better feeling, and it's a funny thing yeah. because everybody in a high-security penitentiary can't wait to get yeah. to a medium. Yeah. But when you get to a medium, you meet a lot of people that said, oh, I wish I was in the United States penitentiary. They be, they be faking, man. They be faking. <laughs> they really want to go to the pen. Yeah, but because... But it's serious. Yeah, it's, it's serious. serious. And, and, and yet, if you're in a low, you have to listen. You can learn a lot from Randy's story because he is sharing with you, wow, the reality is what I'm getting out of his story is that he made decisions that determined how yeah. the prison was, right? When he decided to go yeah. hard in Lewisburg, well, it was hard. And as a result of those decisions, there were consequences. When he yeah. decided to transform his life, he went to a medium and he made the most of it. When he's yeah. in a low, he's always going to remember because I know I met Randy when he was in a low security prison. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, again, the weight of the world comes off you when you go from a medium to a low. After um, being in Estelle for, I think, about three years, I was transferred to uh, Fort Dix in New Jersey. And that was a low. And I mean, from going from a maximum security to a minimum to a medium security and then going to a low security, I mean, you did, you thought, you did, thought you was free to yeah. a certain point. You know what I mean? I mean, it was just, it was just mentally, uh, 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 it, it, it was just so better to be able to be in those type of uh, uh, facilities that you didn't have those uh, pressures of what the pressures be like in the penitentiary because to be honest with you, sometimes the tension in the penitentiary is so thick. You hear this expression, you can cut it with a knife, it's so thick. It's literally, you can feel the tension in the air. It's incredibly it's stressful. Really, it's really, you can feel the tension in the air. And it's, I mean, who wants to live like that? Um, once I got to the low, I was pretty already in that mindset of, of change. Uh, change started for me, I'm going to say probably when I was in Allenwood, it, it started really um, taking, taking a hold of me um, because I was so close to home. I reconnected with my family. I was seeing them more often. I was seeing my kids. And then, you know, I started thinking about, you know, my future. Uh, well, what I want to do when I get out? That's, that was, you know, my mindset once I got to Allenwood, really about what I was going to do when I got out. I, didn't, I know one thing. I didn't want to go back to prison. I had enough of that. That was something I didn't want to experience ever again, you know. And it was amazing to me because 
so many people I had seen go home uh, uh, during the course of my incarceration and then they came back. Yeah. And I'm saying to myself, what is it about this place, this experience that you complain about it every day, you don't like being here, uh, 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 you're miserable, I mean, it's just a, such a, a, a miserable situation, what would drive a person to come back? And then I really started taking stock of the environment and then I started seeing, you can pretty much understand why a lot of people go back to prison. If you I, I can, what, tell, you, what I can they, tell you one thing, Randy. Why, why, why they're there. One thing about it is you, the prison system, a lot of times people focus on the wrong thing. They focus on how am I going to live in prison? And the more you learn to live in prison, the more you learn to fail when you get out. And, and Randy is living proof that you can flip that script. You can flip that mindset and change the way you think. And as soon as you do, the world opens up for you and you build yeah. this life of success and meaning and relevance. And I'm just so proud to talk with Randy now because the last time I saw him, I still had 10 years to go in prison. And since this is the first time we've really connected since I got out and he's just an amazing success out, out here right now. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Let's just shift this focus a little bit to how successful you have become just getting out. When did you finish your prison term, bro? Man, I finished, I came home in August of 2005. August um, of 2005, he comes home and walk us through a little bit about, because I think we're going to have to do a second episode, Randy. Your story is so epic and so inspirational, I think, to people who are locked up. And there's so much they can, we can all learn from yeah, you. Yeah that I don't want to do this in 30 minutes. We're going to have to have back-to-back -back episodes. So I encourage you, if you're listening to this, to tune back in tomorrow because we're going to have another episode with Randy that gives us the details of it. But right now, let's just have a little, a little teaser. Tell us the name of the businesses that you're running right now, Randy. Um, I have a company called Reentry Strategies. Uh, it's a company that we create content to help incarcerated and formerly incarcerated individuals uh, successfully prepare for uh, getting out of prison and reintegrating re back into their families, their communities, and to society as, as a whole. Uh, we create solutions for returning citizens to transition successfully. Um, one of the things that I do is I create reentry programs. Uh, we've developed two successful reentry programs right now. We're working on a few more. Um, they're based out of my experiences and uh, some of the successes and some of the challenges that I've faced uh, since getting out. But mostly what we do is try to show people how to do time with their time, what to, how to use their time while they're doing time in preparation for going out. What I found during my uh, incarceration experience is that a lot of people want to get out. Everybody's waiting to get out. We want to get out, we want to get out but not too many people are focusing on what they're going to do when they get out. And, and as a result of that, what happens to them when they get out? They, they, they wind up, you know, just once they're faced with different challenges, because they didn't prepare themselves, they wind up making rational decisions, they get frustrated, and they go back to their old behaviors and their old type of ways and pretty much give up on themselves. So you have to prepare for getting out before you get out. And that's, that's, that's what we focus on and how to face those challenges, but also how to begin to understand where you fit as far as taking responsibility for your life. You know, you can blame the system, you can blame your environment, you can blame uh, the past, you can blame all of these things on uh, where you find yourself in life, but ultimately a lot of time it's the result of the choices that you make and that you've made that have put you into different uh, situations. So I focus on trying to get people to take responsibility for their life and how to basically shift that mindset from the negative to a positive. You know, you, and that's you, you, the reason that you have credibility, Randy, is because you're the real deal. They should be learning from somebody like you because you can tell people both sides. You can talk about what it's yeah. like to adjust in a high security prison and you can talk about the results of that. Then you can talk about 
how do you get to a lower security prison? How do you move your way to a pathway to success? And you've got the credibility to speak about it. That's why I'm so honored to have you on Prison Professors. I think you've got a lot to offer. Could you show our audience a copy of some of the amazing books that you've written? <laughs> this book right here, really, uh, well, I don't have a copy of my first book, which is called Street Talk, The Official Guide to Hip Hop and Urban Slang, which that's a 750-page uh, dictionary slash lexicon that interprets the whole hip hop and urban slang vernacular. Um, it is an amazing, amazing book. It took me probably like seven, eight years to put together. And that book itself took me through uh, a good majority of my incarceration because I worked on it. I focused on just that. I focused on, you know, completing that and getting that together. So that I spent a long time. And that's pretty much when we met in Fort Dix that I had this, you know, uh, a project that I was working on. And I found that, that you were writing, and that's what kind of co we connected on. And, you know, you was able to give me some uh, tips and advice and show me certain things when it comes to writing and stuff like that. Then, that's uh, an important message, what you're giving right there. See, when you focus on negative things, you end up hanging out with dudes that are doing negative things. Exactly. When you say, hey, I'm going to turn my attention to writing a book that the market wants, you start looking for other people that are doing that, and that networking a positive networking leads to positive results. And I'm so proud of you for coming up with writing a book while you were incarcerated because I know how hard it is and then turn it into a career, man, so that you've come home and you've been writing more books. Tell us a little bit more about the other books you've written. Um, well, I just want to just give the viewers a little, you know, walk them through like all of some of the things that I've done while I was there, how they transpired from when I got out. So that dictionary actually, um, I got a book deal for that dictionary probably like, six months after getting out of prison. And what was amazing, you know, you, it's a lot to, you can learn a lot in prison. You can learn a lot about yourself and you can learn a lot how to function in, in society while you're incarcerated because I, had a, I got a lot of negative feedback from people when I was writing that first book. You know, it's never gonna sell, you know, nobody's gonna wanna read it, you know, you're going back to, to the street when you get out, blah, blah, blah. and then, uh, if I didn't believe in myself and believe in the things that I was going to do when I got out, I would have let other people influence me and discourage me from uh, completing that path. So one of the biggest accomplishments that I got out, six, when I got out six months later, I got a book deal for that book. Um, also, what, this is the book that I'm most known for right here. It's called Changing Your Game Plan, How I Used Incarceration as a Stepping Stone for Success. Um, this book is about my life. It's about my experiences. It's about overcoming adversity and about the challenge to change. How I took a negative situation and turned it into a positive opportunity. This book is almost like chronicles my journey of change. How I was able to uh, basically reinvent myself while I was incarcerated. How I practice to do the things that I'm doing today, how I practiced it while I was in prison. How I was preparing myself mentally, emotionally, and, 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 and all the things that I needed to do in order to come out here and do the things that I'm doing. This book right here is an awesome, awesome book. And I'm not saying it just to promote myself in a way that I want people to buy the book, but it's just not about physical incarceration. You don't have to, you may not, you may not want to promote yourself, but I want to promote you, Randy. I want to tell anybody to get that book because changing your game plan, how I used incarceration as a stepping stone for success is a must read for anybody who's going into the criminal justice system or who's locked up in the prison system because we need to learn from leaders, people who've actually done it. I mean, if you're out here in society and you're uh, involved in the sales business, you might read a book about Zig Ziglar or Tony Robbins or somebody else who's an expert. I can tell you that Randy Kearse is an expert about how to go through prison, change your mindset, and become successful. I've sold, I've sold over 80,000 copies of this book by and myself. He, and by you myself. sold those 80,000 copies. Tell them how you do it, Randy. <laughs> um, I've sold um, on the subway. I sell them on the subway. Um, known throughout the New York City area, um, I've sold books to people from all walks of life. I mean, you don't have to be physically incarcerated to get something from my book because we all are faced with different challenges and different struggles in our life. And it's how we overcome them, how we approach them, what they do to make us who we're supposed to be. Those are the things that I talk about in my book, how to overcome the mindset that keeps a lot of people stuck in the place that they need to um, 
free themselves from. So I, I'm also a, a motivational speaker. I travel the country. Um, I've spoken in prisons and jails and schools and uh, business meetings and every like everything like that. I've been in the New York Times. I've been in the Daily News twice. I've been on the Colbert Report. Um, I've done many many radio and TV interviews and stuff like that. So um, basically, man, just showing people how you can how you can change, how you can how add prison, value. How prison doesn't you know, a prison doesn't, didn't define me. It doesn't define who we are. It's what we do with that experience that makes us who we are. What we take out of that experience uh, that makes us who we are. And I talk about those things of how to be patient. Randy, we gotta we gotta end it because we got we were over time on this one. We gotta have a second interview. I yeah. encourage you if you're listening to this program, please come back tomorrow, and we're going to get into the nuts and bolts, the details of how Randy Kiersey went from prison to paradise with his successful journey, writing books, creating programs, starting companies. I want to promote a couple of other of Randy's books. He's got the Blueprint for Success Reentry Program. He's got incarceration to corporation which he co-authored with jm benjamin he's got video programs he's got re-entry programs he's got journals he is a one-man operation of showing people how to prepare for success beyond prison probation and parole is another one of his video products you're going to listen to how he did it all tomorrow and it's my hope that you will find some hope and inspiration in listening to his amazing story and if you're somebody who works in corrections, you want to get somebody like Randy on your team because he can help improve the outcomes of your prison, jail, or school. You can find Randy at randykiersey.co or through his uh, corporate website, which I think, Randy, is reentrystrategies.com. Is that right? Yes, reentrystrategies.com, uh, R-E-E-N-T-R-Y-S-T-R-A-E-G-I-E-S.com. And then there's randykiersey.co. R-A-N-D-Y-K-E-A-R-S-E dot C-O. And we will have links to his websites and his books directly on our show notes. We are going to try and recruit Randy to become a prison professor, part of our team here. Um, if you want to learn more about how we work and try to improve outcomes of the criminal justice system, visit prisonprofessors.com or send a text of prison pro to 44222. That's text prison pro to 44222. Or visit our website and you can get a direct link to Randy Kearse. I am Michael with Prison Professors and I thank you. We'll be back tomorrow with episode number two of the amazing Randy Kearse. Thank you.